Hello and welcome to the first Lowy Institute live event of 2021. A warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia and to those who are Zooming in from overseas. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. President Biden has now been in office for more than a fortnight. Most of his cabinet is in place and we're starting to see the outlines of the new administration. But Donald Trump hasn't yet left the stage. He's returned to Mar-a-Lago, but his impeachment trial in the Senate begins on Monday. So there's a lot going on. And to help us make sense of it all, I'm delighted to have as my guests today, two of Washington's most interesting, informed and influential commentators. David Ignatius is a prize-winning foreign affairs columnist at the Washington Post. Over the course of four decades, he's written about America's foreign relations intelligence issues in the world. On the side, he's also written 11 spy novels, which I recommend highly. In 2016, David was the Lowy Institute's Distinguished International Fellow here in Australia, a fellowship that has also been held by Biden administration officials, Jake Sullivan and Kurt Campbell. Amy Walter is one of the best informed political journalists and analysts in Washington. As a national editor of the Cook Political Report, she provides analysis of the issues, trends, and events that shape the political environment. She's also a regular contributor to the PBS NewsHour. So welcome, David and Amy. Great to be with you. Glad to be here. All right, some brief housekeeping. I'm going to have a conversation with David and Amy for about 40 minutes. I'm going to start off on the politics of the day and then move on to foreign policy. And then I'm going to put to David and Amy some questions that have been submitted by our audience members. So Amy, I'm going to begin with you. And I want to go back in time and just review the events of the last a couple of months over, over Christmas. Now that the dust has settled, what, do you, what did you make of the 2020 election? There was a lot of discussion about how close it was, whether it was stolen and so on. Um, how comprehensive a victory in historical terms did Joe Biden win in November? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. And I am sorry that we have to do this remotely someday soon. Hopefully we'll be able to cross our oceans and borders and see each other again. Um, and you're right, Michael, it's, it's, it's so much more um, to me um, interesting to go back and look at an election because trying to do it in live time as we saw especially this year is challenging. It was especially challenging in this last election because so many people voted by absentee or voted early that we didn't have the final vote counts on election night or the day after the election, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason of course and it's the thing that the president points to as to why the election was uh, rigged or was unfair to him, um, which of course, all of those have been um, uh, debunked um, and uh, those claims are, are, are untrue. But I think what we learned about uh, our country after the election are, are a couple of things. Um, and we will learn more actually in the next month or so once we get the voter files, so all the voters who voted, they're updated, those updated lists are usually done by February or March. So you ha have even more detailed analysis. But, but just broadly speaking, um, it, it, we are still an incredibly polarized country. Um, and Donald Trump did more, I think, to sort of highlight it. He didn't create it, but he certainly made the divisions um, deeper, more substantial, and potentially, and this is what we're really waiting to see, is how long lasting they will be. Um, what's interesting, if you look back at, at, at history, as you pointed out, Michael, you know, Biden won by a record number uh, or got more votes than any president in, in history at 81 million. Donald Trump coming in at, with the second most votes in history at 74 million. But his four point win, so overall was a four point win over Donald Trump was similar to Barack Obama's. Uh, Barack Obama won his reelection by four points, but unlike President Obama, he didn't win as many states um, and he didn't have any coattails down ballot, whether for the Senate or the House. In fact, Democrats lost, it looks like it will be 12 seats in, in the House, so they're barely hanging on to their majority there. Um, 
What we also know is that uh, while the 7 million number, that's the gap between the, mm -hmm. the popular vote margin is impressive. Um, it was about 44,000 votes that separated Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden in the key battleground states like Wisconsin, Georgia, Arizona. Had those votes gone the other way, and I, I sort of shudder because of what this would have looked like, uh, we would have had a 269-269 tie mm. in the Electoral College, which would have meant that the uh, presidential race would be decided by the US House of Representatives. So if we think we're divided and polarized now, just imagine what that would have looked like. Um, but even as Donald Trump, so it was incredibly close on the one hand, it wasn't very close on the popular vote um, mm -hmm. on the other. And the other interesting thing is for all of the talk uh, that um, Donald Trump had, had been giving throughout his time as president about the silent majority. There are all these Americans who support me, but they're not coming out to uh, uh, or tell people about it, but they'll come out and vote. He still is the only president in American history, uh, at least pol polling history, so recent history, uh, to never hit a 50% job approval rating as president. He, as in terms of the popular vote, he went from 45.9% of the popular vote in 2016 to just 46.9% in 2020. So all of these new voters came in and yet, and he got a record number of votes, and yet he really barely moved the needle. At the uh, at the state level, he only performed five less than a, a half percent better in Michigan, about a half percent better in Pennsylvania, a little over a point better in Arizona. So in, in many ways, it feels as if we are kind of running in place. There's so much tumult, there was so much craziness that was the year 2020. And at the end, what we found was we we got something of a status quo in the sense of a, a president who was obviously he was unsuccessful, but he did not bring down uh, the rest of his party in the way that many had expected. All right. Very interesting. And I'll come back to, to some of those issues a little bit later. David, let me bring you in. We got a result um, in the election, but instead of the normal transition, we had something like an interregnum, I guess I would say. <laughs> Former President Trump refused to concede defeat. He cast doubt on the integrity of the electoral process, as Amy said. And finally, he incited an insurrection at the Capitol on the 6th of January. Even to repeat that now reminds me how remarkable it is. David, you've covered the news from all over the world for four decades, including coups, from all over the world. Um, it looks like there was an attempted coup or an insurrection in any case in your country on the 6th of January. What were your reflections on it at the time and what kind of impact do you think it's had on international perceptions of the United States? Well, I, I think uh, Michael, at the period of the two months after election day uh, through January 6th were um, as scary a time as, as I can remember. Um, if it were overseas, you would speak about um, an attempt to seize the power ministries, the way in which the Secretary of Defense was replaced, in uh, the way in which uh, people who were passionate political loyalists for Trump were put in key positions in the uh, Defense Department. The attempts were told to uh, release highly sensitive classified information that Trump thought would bolster his case. Uh, I think that was a period where um, if it was another country, you would, you would call it flatly an attempted coup. Um, and as I look back, I feel a deep sense of gratitude to the people who kept us from going over the edge uh, at a time when Donald Trump was pushing very hard with millions of passionate supporters behind him. And the heroes for me in many cases are Republicans. They're Republican judges, Supreme Court justices, um, state election officials, the, the secretaries of state in each state who 
monitored the, the election, uh, the person who was responsible for election security at the Department of Homeland Security who got fired for, for saying publicly uh, this was the most straightforward, uh, least uh, fraudulent election uh, that he could remember, vouched for the results, got fired for it, but, but stood up for for, for, for principle, I, I was struck by the way in which the military under the, uh, General uh, Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff made clear from the beginning that they would not allow the military to be manipulated, not, not allow the military to be drawn into, uh, into a political role supporting uh, Trump. And I also was amazed by the behavior of some officials who had been um, sometimes uh, disturbingly uh, uh, pro-Trump, supportive of, of the worst of Trump's instincts, like Attorney General William Barr, uh, standing up in the end and saying, no, uh, I, 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 will, I refuse to support the declassification of the information that that you, that you want out. No, I refuse to 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 stand behind your challenge of the of the election results. Uh, there are other cases. The the for, former White House Counsel uh, Pat Cipollone is is another example of somebody who, in the first impeachment uh, debate, was was uh, reliably. Uh, pro-Trump, but in the end, from what my sources tell me, played quite a courageous role in drawing limits for Trump. Obviously, you'd add to that the Georgia uh, officials, the governor, uh, other officials who refused Trump's demands, threats really, uh, to alter uh, the uh, Georgia vote results. Find me 11,000 votes was the, what Trump said in the phone call that we that we remember. So, this period, as you said, was uh, was uh, sh should be uh, worrying to uh, people overseas who look at America. But I think they should be reassured by all the things that happen behind the scenes. Uh, in, in a way, uh, as as frightening as Trump's assault on our democracy was. My takeaway is that we learned a lot about our resilience uh -huh. and, and we learned that uh, in a pinch, Republican officials who were facing sometimes physical threats um, stood up for, for what they thought was right. All right, Amy, in the aftermath of those riots, the House of Representatives voted to impeach President Trump for an unprecedented second time. And attention now turns to uh, Donald Trump's trial in the Senate, which is set to begin on Monday. Let me ask you two questions. First of all, was it a good idea for Democrats to impeach the president for, the second, for a second time? And secondly, for those of our viewers who are not watching it minute by minute, just give us a sense of what this trial will, will look like next week and what is the most likely outcome? Um, so... As David pointed out, and, and I think it's, you know, it, it was only a month ago and, and already like so much of this last oh. year, you know, you can't quite remember, was it a month ago? Was it a year ago? Was it yesterday? Right. So much has happened. We just are overwhelmed um, with uh, the amount of news and the amount of once in a lifetime events in just a short period of time. But um, the, the assault on the Capitol um, has struck, especially members who work in that building in a way that um, uh, was actually um, unifying for a short period of time. Um, and I think even privately, what you would hear from Republicans was how horrible it was, how terrible um, it was, how much they, they blamed uh, the president and his rhetoric. Um, and so, in that moment, it wasn't surprising to see the House deciding that the, that impeachment is the way to go. And at one point, Michael, it looked as if you might get a bunch of Republicans actually going along, Again, it, you know, going back into those days post um, uh, post riot when you know more and more uh, stories were coming out, more and more video was getting released, um, and you had the the leader of the Republicans in the Senate coming out and suggesting 
very openly that he would support an impeachment. The third ranking Republican in the House um, saying she was going to support impeachment. So it looked like there might be some momentum there. And then that momentum sort of hit a wall. And, and this has been the story really of America in the last four years, which is we go through these incredible moments that we think, okay, certainly here's the breaking point. This is the point at which all Americans come together and say, all right, that's it. We're not gonna stand for this. Or Republicans are gonna stand up and say, okay, that, nope, can't stand behind the president anymore. And we, we watched it throughout the 2016 election, right? Uh, thing after thing that Donald Trump would say, and those of us in the press would say, well, okay, this, this is the time when, when Republicans will walk away. Um, and uh, it, it didn't happen, obviously, while he was a candidate, while he was president, you would see some dips, but then they would always come back. And as such, we've seen that too with the Capitol riots, that essentially the, the allegiance to the president um, is as much about um, the fear that many of these Republicans have of their base, that when they listen to the folks in their home districts and their home states who say, why would you blame the president for this? This isn't his fault. This is about a lot of other things. Sure, it was a terrible, horrible thing that happened, but why would you impeach the president? This is just Democrats playing politics. And so the farther away we get, from the actual event, the easier it has been for Republicans to sort of compartmentalize this and make this a, a procedural argument rather than an argument on the actual facts. And so when you ask what this trial is gonna look like, um, we don't really know exactly what it's going to look like. The president himself has gone through um, a number of lawyers already. Um, so these are brand new lawyers that um, he has brought on board within the last week. Uh, so that's not much time to get yourself ready for this, but it seems as if you know they're going to make again a procedural case that not only did uh, the president, you know, he was not directly um, uh, giving orders to attack the Capitol, but you're going to hear from a lot of Republicans in the Senate who are sitting in as jurors that you know this is really unconstitutional. This idea of impeaching someone who's no longer in office. And at the end of the day, I think what we will end up seeing is um, uh, a trial going forward that's gonna be much shorter than the first one. Um, it could be uh, obviously a lot more emotionally charged because of the fact that, well, the, the, the issue itself is much more emotionally charged, but that if there are five Republicans who vote to impeach, that would be probably the, uh, the most that we're likely to see. And so the question then comes, it keeps coming out, uh, we, we keep coming back to this, which is, okay, well, isn't that now the end of Donald Trump's um, sort of shadow over the party? Mm. Once we get through impeachment, uh, he no longer has Twitter. Uh, he's no longer sitting in the Capitol. He doesn't have the pull that he once did. Mm. And yet the repercussions for not supporting Donald Trump keep coming, right? Um, that these members who voted for impeachment are finding themselves being censured by their local parties will be primaried. The third ranking House member, Liz Cheney, um, she held on to her uh, leadership position, but 60 members of her own party voted to oust her. So even as he's not there, uh, Donald Trump, the, 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 the Trump-ism remains. All right, David, maybe with a sigh of relief, let me move on to the, the incumbent president, the new president. Um, he's not paying a lot of attention to, the, impeach, to the, the impeachment trial in the Senate. He's getting on with governing. David, let me ask you a general question. What kind of president do you think Joe Biden will be? If you were to reach for historical parallels, is there another president you think he might resemble? I mean, I'm struck that he's an older gentleman, um, I wonder if, for example, he might focus on big picture items and leave some of the detail work to the cabinet and the staff, for example, in the way that Ronald Reagan did. Is that a reasonable analogy? What kind of president will Joe Biden make? Well, I think uh, Reagan is, is, uh, is an interesting uh, uh, analogy, a genial, uh, older guy, gift of gab, uh, sort of, charm of the Blarney and 
back slapping. Um, people sometimes make a comparison to Harry Truman. And I, I think there's there's something to that. Harry, Harry Truman was, was a man who was underestimated, um, just not seen as, as in any way up to the job of being president, but surprised on the upside. What I've been struck by about Biden is that um, the expectations about him were so low uh, during the, the campaign. And to be honest, his energy was so low as a candidate. It really, I mean, Trump's comment about campaigning from the basement wasn't all, all that off the mark. Um, but he's had an extraordinary first two weeks. It's It's mm -hmm. been the best scripted and managed uh, rollout of a presidency that I can remember. Uh, the personnel choices generally were good. He put together a cabinet of people uh, he was comfortable with, uh, in many cases, who, who he'd worked with for, for decades. Um, you could just see uh, today, when he went to the State Department, we'll talk about this later, just how close he is personally with, with Tony Blinken, the, the Secretary of State. So uh, it, it was a comfort level cabinet, as, as I described it in one column. But I'm also struck by uh, how tightly and, and efficiently managed this White House is. Uh, Biden opted for a very strong chief of staff in Ron Klain, who is somebody that your viewers probably know very little about. But if I were to identify somebody who's really um, responsible for the success of these first two weeks, it would be Ron Klain. Uh, things have happened every day, just as planned. Every day there's been the rollout of a new set of policies, a series of executive orders. Uh, th this is an administration that um, is doing messaging um, with great skill, they remind me of the early uh, Obama period. They obviously coordinate. I, I'm sure each of the press people get on the phone every morning and coordinate what the what the message will be. Uh, Jake Sullivan put together an unusually strong National Security Council staff. Um, his Asia expert, Kurt Campbell, a former Lowy Institute fellow, is um, by nearly everybody's account. Uh, in the U.S., the, the the person who's really the wisest strategist, uh, Kurt has come in to coordinate Asia, Asia policy. Similarly, for the Middle East, uh, Brett McGurk, a person who's widely respected, uh, is going to be running policy. Finally, I'd note in the unlikely, but but probably uh, quite brilliant uh, personnel decisions, the the decision to put uh, Bill Burns, mm -hmm. former deputy deputy secretary of state universally respected as a foreign, foreign service officer, to put him in as head of the CIA was unconventional. He has no intelligence background, but was immediately embraced um, at the agency, I'm told, and, and widely in Washington. So it's just been, a, a, a again, maybe there's an advantage to being underestimated. Harry Truman had that advantage. People thought this guy can never do it. And he ended up being by, by many accounts, one of our better modern presidents. People certainly underestimated Joe Biden, but so far uh, he's had it just right. I, I'll mention one final thing. And Amy Wynn may also want to speak to this. I think one of the smartest things that Biden has done is just to not give Trump any oxygen. He doesn't comment about the impeachment trial. He's been studiously neutral. It's kind of like, it's not my business. It's for the Senate to decide. He just won't get drawn into this partisan craziness that we've been living with. Donald Trump's off Twitter now, so we don't have wild spikes every every day coming out of Twitter to, to set the nation on, on fire. And so, you know, uh, as, as, uh, as, Trump called him Sleepy Joe just because genial old guy. And he's got this super sort of like this, you know, uh, grandpa in in the fastest roadster in town, and it's an interesting combination. Yeah, I'm yeah. an image of uh, of grandpa in the aviator glasses in the yeah. Trans Am is is definitely appearing on my cortex. 
Amy, um, let me let me on that on that topic. Um, Biden Biden is as as we say, Biden is sort of going high. He's ignoring President Trump. He's trying to unify the country, and obviously, um, he, the the urge, the instinct, the reflex to reach for bipartisan agreement has been at the centre of uh, Biden's shtick since he entered national politics right. in the 1970s. But you, you earlier in this discussion, you pointed to how divided America is after the November election. So how, what are Biden's chances, do you think, of unifying America? Uh, excellent question. It's something that we're talking about a lot here. <laughs> and to David's point on, on how well Biden's been doing and you know, I think his mantra basically is whatever Trump did, we're doing the opposite, which was also his campaign message, right? Who am I? I'm not Trump. How am I going to operate? Not like Trump. Who are the people going to be around me? They're not going to be anything like the people Trump brought around him. Mm. So it really is like literally every day is a reminder of that. It, 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 yes, the policy is going to be different, but just literally the, the um, ability for people um, in and around Washington, but quite frankly, around the world um, to know that there's some predictability back. Um, I think it has, has like ha uh, given a big sigh of relief, right? Just this, just one, um, one thing uh, that feels so different from where we were just a month or a little over a month ago. Um, as for the unity question, you know, this is, um, the, the fight that uh, Democrats and Republicans are having right now. Biden campaign, no, now Biden White House will tell you that look, when we talked about unity on the campaign, it didn't mean that it, uh, we were gonna do everything in a bipartisan manner. It didn't mean that we were only gonna pass legislation that Republicans liked. It didn't mean that everything was going to be bipartisan. It meant that we were going to be open to conversations. It meant that we were gonna be civil. It meant they were gonna look for openings. Uh, it meant that we weren't gonna attack people on Twitter day in and day out, including people in our own party. Uh, Republicans say, well, you're not really trying for unity if you're just going to, in your first moments in office, um, uh, go about uh, uh, signing multiple executive orders that um, are basically a wish list of democratic progressive mm -hmm. uh, policies on climate, on immigration, on things like transgender uh, military um, soldiers. And, and uh, so I said, that's not unifying. Um, here's the biggest challenge, and you're right, there is this sort of uh, reflexive um, Bidenism to look for the middle to look to, for the the Republican he can bring in, um, and if you've been around Joe Biden and all, you will hear the story about Jesse Helms. You'll hear the story about all the other people that he's worked with over the years on the other side, who he had in, in, policy wise, politically, ideologically, nothing in common with, but found a way to sort of connect with him. Here's the challenge, and when you look at, for example, how many members of the House sit in a district that is that was won by the opposite candidate. So a Biden Republican district or a Trump Democratic district. There are only 17 of those total, mm. 17. Uh, there were 63 of those uh, back in 2008. The last time the Senate was 50-50 as it is today, there were 30 senators who, who were from a state that the presidential nominee of their party did not carry. Today, there are six. And so it comes down to what life usually comes down to, which is incentives. There is very little political incentive to do a bipartisan bill because ultimately, if you sit in a district that is red or sit in a district that is blue, What's the benefit you're going to get from working with the other side? Nothing. You're likely going to get a challenge, a primary challenge, or in the case, as we saw, we were talking about the impeachment debate, you're going to get potentially kicked out of your own caucus by your own members, people that you work with day in and day out. So the incentive structure is so very different today 
than it was um, 20 years ago. And so it, it, it means that we, when we talk about you know, finding unity or finding ways for the two sides to work together, we have to think beyond just how many Republicans, how many Democrats voted for it. Finally, the thing that I will add and, 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 and I think needs to, to really be understood is, you know, this divide in America, we talk about the blue and the red state, but it's more than just that they're voting for Democrats or Republicans, and it's more than just ideology. Um, this is happening all over the world. It's happening, I'm sure, in Australia too, this divide between sort of more urban um, areas and, and those that are more small town and rural. But um, it's not just a it's not just a who they're voting for divide. It's that the priorities of the two parties are completely different. Um, again, back in 2000, the Pew Research Center has been asking this question since 2000 about, you know, what are your top priorities to Republican voters? What are your top priorities to Democratic voters? And in 2000, um, of the top five priorities on the Democratic list, all but one were the similar on the, de on the um, Democratic list or vice versa, right? So maybe education is number one on the Democratic side and it's number three on the Republican side, but still they had about the same uh, issues in their top priorities. Um, today there are, or the last time they did this poll was in 2019, there are zero, mm -hmm. zero. So the top five issues uh, for Democrats are not the top five issues of Republicans. So it's hard to come to an agreement, right? If we don't agree on the problem. Mm. Right, that's very sobering. Um, David, <laughs> David, let me ask, let me move on to the America and the world. And you mentioned uh, President Biden's first foreign policy speech as president that he gave overnight. Um, he gave that speech at Foggy Bottom at the State Department. He announced that diplomacy is back. Uh, I noticed that our mutual friend Jake Sullivan also said overnight that Biden's national security strategy will lead with diplomacy. So what were the what were the cues that you picked up from that speech? What did you notice? What was of interest most interest to, to you from that foggy bottom speech? The foreign policy speech, as Amy said about Biden generally, was um, an "I am not Donald Trump" speech. He went down the list. Uh, I'm going to rebuild the shattered alliances. Uh, he was very specific about Russia. The days of rolling over to Russia are finished. Uh, he said, interestingly, about uh, China, that although we're going to compete with China, he's prepared to work with, with China. I thought that was significant. Uh, he he uh, broke from uh, tr Trump's uh, total support for uh, Saudi Arabia and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman by saying the U.S. will no longer supply weapons for the war in Yemen. I think there's going to be a sig significant initiative to try to, to do some diplomacy uh, in the Yemen war. There's a prisoner exchange that's about to happen, which has been organized uh, in Jordan. Uh, we have a new special envoy who for many years has been the State Department's lead person uh, for Saudi Arabia, Tim Lenderking, whose job is, is gonna be to see is there some way we can broker uh, regional support for uh, a, a resolution in Yemen. I think that's actually uh, somewhat closer than, than, than people may imagine. The final thing that was very uh, untrumpian, uh, but is gonna, is gonna be, part of, of, uh, of Biden's style is to embrace the State Department itself. He, he, Trump almost fell all over himself saying how much he loved diplomats and you're great. And, you know, it was it was wonderful. He talked about their uh, personal courage and going to difficult places and a real expression of support. And, and, and uh, Trump um, viewed the State Department, viewed the CIA, viewed the, much of the government as what he and his supporters would call the deep state. Wow. Uh, so if you're a State Department Foreign Service officer, uh, you felt pretty good after, after that, that speech. Uh, I think uh, in terms of significant outlines of the f foreign policy that, that's ahead on, on, on the hard issues, we haven't seen much yet. Uh, we have a suggestion of 
uh, of seeking some sort of opening uh, with with China. We'll see how that develops. Uh, there are other issues we can talk about that are of interest to your uh, the viewers in, in Asia. But uh, in general, I thought it was a good, uh, comforting speech. Um, diplomacy's back, America's back, uh, parentheses, Donald Trump is gone. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big change from the deep state department, if you like, to the state department. Um, <laughs> let, let, me, let me draw you out on the comment, David, you made or the illusion you made there to China and this balance between a competition and cooperation that the Biden administration seeks to strike. Um, there's been some speculation, as you know, that as with the Obama administration, a desire to do deals with China to do global deals, whether it's on climate or other issues, might mean at some point that the competition uh, element is shelved and allies are sidelined. And I noticed an article in the Wall Street Journal the other day on the team of rivals that was, that was portraying John Kerry and Kurt Campbell, for example, on opposite sides of the China argument and, and saying this may be um, a big sort of division in the administration. Is that the way you see it? And you know, if you were to squint your eyes, do you think Biden, the, the Biden administration will emphasize more on the competition side or more on the cooperation side? Well, first, uh, John Kerry has, has made a point of trying to refute this mm -hmm. idea that he would um, urge uh, concessions to, to, with, to China so as to get Chinese support on climate change. Um, the talk of, of uh, some sort of uh, rivalry between Kerry and notably Kurt Campbell, uh, but also uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, one hears a lot of that. Um, my own sense is that um, they're going to try very hard to compart compartmentalize their China policy. So there will be a a climate file, and they're going to make a powerful pitch to the Chinese that it's in your interest, in your interest economically, in terms of your global leadership position to work with us. Uh, we'll see how much success they have. But it'd be surprising to me if China resisted an American supported effort to, to move forward on, on climate change. I think, in terms of protecting very sensitive US technology, especially uh, the uh, technologies uh, involved in, in chip making, I, I think we're going to see more continuity from Trump policies than, than change. I, I think there's general recognition among uh, U.S. Uh, specialists uh, on China that uh, we need to be very careful about um, protecting our lead in, in the most important technologies. The research that I've done uh, to look at the extent to which China is really leaping ahead of us in uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing and the, the, the various strands that would be part of future dominance, that's overstated. Uh, the United States lead remains pretty substantial. And I think there's uh, a consensus from Sullivan, Campbell, uh, Blinken, throughout the government, that it's important to protect that. So I, I, would, I would think there will be strands of, of cooperation, but the sort of fundamental idea that we're going to have in technology and our, 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 our leading edge, uh, even at the cost of, 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 I want to call it partial decoupling in, in the U.S.-Chinese uh, technology and, and perhaps uh, you, know, you know part of the economic relationship I, I think I think that's that people should expect there would be some de decoupling all right Amy let me bring you in on this climate change uh, question if I can we've seen a lot of action um, in the early couple of weeks from the Biden administration on energy policy and climate policy. Um, David mentioned, of course, the appointment of a former presidential candidate and, and Secretary of State as the climate change envoy, but also rejoining Paris, um, designating climate change as a top national security priority, saying that the government fleet of, I think it's 650,000 cars and trucks will be replaced with electric vehicles. How big a shift in the domestic energy and climate change debate are we going to see under the Biden administration? And 
to the extent that you can comment, what kind of change to the global atmospherics do you think that will have on the climate change, uh, the global climate change debate going from the Trump uh, period to the Biden period? All right. Well, it gets at, Michael, this divide that we were talking about in this country, you know, the sort of red and blue. And when you look um, just physically, geographically about, you know, the big differences between red America and blue America, uh, red America is predominantly, and again, this is true in, in, in some other countries, um, driven by the following industries, you know, energy extraction, <laughs> ranching and farming, and, and manufacturing. And it is in the blue areas where it's, you know, it's trade and it's um, finance and it is the, the sort of thing that we're doing right now, right? Consulting and, and, and all of those sorts of things that you can do in an, in an internet age. It's a, a knowledge-based um, industries. And so um, Donald Trump ran uh, again uh, on a, uh, on a message that there is a real America and there's a not real America. And in real America, uh, we, you know, love coal and love drilling for oil and, and any, um, any attempt to uh, regulate or overregulate or to in, in, in impinge on that is basically saying, you know, you're anti-American. Um, but we've been having these fights uh, for some time. This isn't new. And, and again, so we've, we've in some ways had it litigated in this last election. Um, we had it litigated in the 2016 election about you know, who's, who is the most normal uh, American, the one who's supporting um, climate change, um, you know, real mitigation on, on climate change or one who is saying, you know, this isn't such a big deal. And in this case, if you know, you're Biden, you say, well, we, we have already sort of won that fight. And if you look at the polling on, on a lot of these issues, um, you know, even on the issue of, of the quote unquote Green New Deal, most Americans have no idea what that means. It sounds kind of nice, right? Everybody likes green, everybody likes a deal, put them together, there we go, perfect. Uh, so most people have no concept of what, uh, of what that is. The areas that are skeptical about the doing more on climate change are areas in which, again, just from a pure political standpoint, if you're just looking at it that way, um, have already been lost to Democrats and, and aren't likely to come back. Uh, Democrats aren't going to win West Virginia ever again, <laughs> or at least in the near future. Um, and so uh, that, uh, as I said, I think that that piece um, really has been litigated. The question is how much you can really do legislatively. So much of what um, the Biden administration has done and what the Trump administration did was through these executive orders, which we're finding um, this week and last week that the problem with them is that they are ephemeral, right? They're not written law. They're, they're not, they're, they can be overturned with the stroke of a pen from a new president. And so I think the challenge, especially if you're in the energy space, or if you're thinking again, globally about what this, what this is saying to the rest of the world about, you know, their ability to do the hard stuff on climate is, um, we're doing, the U.S. is doing a not great job either, right? Um, we're, we're doing stuff, but it is very much a, you know, one step forward, one step back, and again, not in a uh, fulsome sort of, uh, you know, again, Green New Deal way where we're tackling this uh, comprehensively, but it's taking bits and pieces here and there. I think the thought going forward is generationally, um, this is one of those issues that, you know, once the, uh, those, those folks who are in the 40 and under become uh, the leaders of our world and our country, uh, that these issues are also going to be debated in a, in a very different way. All right, Amy, let me ask you another question. The, probably the toughest and most important issue for President Biden this year is COVID. Um, it's great to have an administration that takes the science seriously, that encourages the use of masks, that's focused on, on rolling out vaccines. But on the other hand, President Biden is still faced with many of the structural issues that hampered the US response to COVID. 
President Trump didn't do a great job himself, but there are a lot of other factors, I think, that went into America's un unimpressive uh, COVID response, including the size of the country, the highly individualistic culture, the hyper-partisanship, perhaps the lack of universal health care, the way your federal system works, which is quite different from the way that um, Australia's federal system works. So how do you think, um, how is the administration approaching the problem of COVID? Um, and how likely is it, do you think that the Biden administration will get the pandemic under control in America by the end of the year? Yeah, that really is everything. I mean, in some ways there is, there, there is nothing more stressful than to come in as a new administration with a crisis that is already um, underway. And, you know, obviously the folks that Biden has brought around him and Biden himself have already experienced that when they came in in 2009 in the middle of a financial crisis. Um, so this in some ways isn't that new to them, but they also uh, know that as you pointed out, the, the, the challenge is more than just getting the, the COVID under control. It's also getting Americans sort of on the same page, right? Where we're all agreeing that wearing a mask is the right thing to do, that getting the vaccine is the right thing to do, to trust the vaccine, to trust the medicine. So I do think that that's um, still some of the structural problems. But fundamentally, you know, the fact is um, that while he was le while he's walking into huge problems, he was also given, as he walked into the White House, the keys to solve them. Well, at least one key, which is the vaccines. And so uh, those are there. And a big piece of this now is, is really about production and distribution and, and getting um, as many of those vaccines to as many people as possible. And I think for um, folks here, or I'll just speak for myself, to me, the end of the summer is going to be really that, that make or break moment, I think, because it will be at that time where I say, all right, there's been six months. Um, it's likely by you know, the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have a COVID package where more money is gonna get pumped into the economy, more money that's gonna go out to testing and distribution and, you know, get, making more masks and, and making more vaccine. Um, you do all that, you get refocused on distribution, the economy will, will bounce back to a certain extent. Um, so you're going to get a, a, a nice little bump again if you are the, thinking about this politically from the B Biden uh, perspective. So things go better with the vaccines, things go better with the economy. Um, but by, by summer, what I think we will have seen then is, okay, are people going back to their quote unquote normal lives? Are kids going back to school? Did we get a summer vacation? My number one concern <laughs> literally at this time is, can I please get my kid out of the house for the summer? Just a couple of summer camps, I'm desperate. Um, and those sorts of things, you know, getting, getting uh, Americans feeling comfortable again mm. is really where he will be judged. Mm. All right, now I said I'd put some questions from our audience to Amy and David. We have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna try to get through uh, a bunch of them. I wanna start with you, David. And I'm actually going to give the prerogative to the chairman of the Lowy Institute, Sir Frank Lowy. Frank asks this, will the world, it's again on the COVID theme, will the world return to normalcy? And if so, when will that happen? And what will that normalcy be like? Mm. Well, first, a salute to your chairman, uh, Sir Frank, and best wishes to, to him. Um, so I, I think the thing that we say about um, about business uh, so many aspects of social life is that there's going to be a new normal the world is is going to come back but it, it's not going to look the same as it did before um, companies individuals uh, countries have adapted uh, this pandemic has uh, tested uh, systems, but there's surprising adaptability in my judgment. Uh, 
Uh, my worry is that uh, one of the really dangerous trends in America and the world, which is the separation, the elites and the people connected with them and their industries uh, prospering, getting increasing returns to their success, their nimbleness produces uh, greater success and greater nimbleness. And then other people who just get left behind, who were unlucky, who were uh, in parts of the, of the country or the world that aren't connected to these uh, uh, very uh, adaptive technologies, that that, that that gap will get greater. And the thing that's the poison in our system that's led to such terrible division, and I, I, I do want to speak a little bit uh, at some point about, about the divisions in America, but, but they're, they're all over the world. Um, Frank, we will come back um, to a kind of normal, but it, it'll be different. And we need to be, uh, I think, quite concerned that, that the differences will exacerbate some of the underlying uh, political and social tensions that existed before and that got us into the mess that we've been, we've been living through. Absolutely. All right, uh, Amy, the next question is from you, for you, and it's from Irene Jablonka, and she asks a question about Dr. Biden, Jill Biden, the, the first lady, of course, whose who's very doctorate actually became the weirdly the subject of political argument, a media argument a few weeks ago. And Irene asks, how do you see her role developing in the administration? Is she likely to be an advisor to the president, a la Rosalind Carter? Uh, I think we're going to see um, Jill Biden fulfill the role in much the way that Michelle Obama did. I mean, both of them are incredibly um, effusive. They are extroverts. Now, she can't do that right now. You know, if we were in a non-COVID time, I'm sure she would have already been at, you know, 16 different events with kids, with school, um, mm -hmm. school events, with all sorts of, you know, with military officers. So I think in, in that sense, she, um, uh, she will be very much like Michelle Obama and also kind of going back to her, you know, she loves to talk about her Philly roots and, and, you know, her very middle-class upbringing um, and her, she does really have an appeal that, that, that crosses um, uh, into so many different kinds of uh, parts of America. You know, she's, she does not come across as this sort of elite, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, are better than you all, right? She's, the, the debate was, can you call her a doctor because she has a doctorate? And, um, and no, she didn't go to an Ivy League school. And no, she doesn't teach at an Ivy League school. She teaches at a community college. Oh. Um, and I just want to just to, to um, echo David's point about, you know, returning to normal. I, I, I agree with him completely that my fear is the, similar that the the have and have nots gap, which has only grown grown in the last twenty years, gets even more significant. Um, there are entire um, uh, industries that have been completely decimated, and a lot of those industries, the service industries, are dominated by women. Um, and even women who can do what we're doing right now, which is work from home, have a computer. If you have a computer, you can work. Have had to drop out of the workforce because they cannot do childcare and work um, and not have school. Um, and so what this means to um, an entire generation of women um, uh, who you know, have broken through so many barriers um, is going to be another thing that I, I fear that um, uh, it, it, we're, we're gonna go backwards. All right, David, um, you alluded before that you wanted to say something about American unity. So let me invite, invite you, if you want to make some comments on that, please do. But while, while you're thinking about that, let me put one other question to you from Hunter Marston at the Australian National University. And Hunter asks, how do you think the Biden team will balance human rights and great power competition in the Asia Pacific? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we got a, a sense today uh, in Biden's speech at the State Department of what will be uh, an increased uh, emphasis on human rights. Uh, he, he's going to uh, change the, our ref refugee resettlement policies from what 
that Trump had, had done. And, and I think he and Secretary of State Tony Blinken are serious about trying to recover uh, some of America's moral leadership. And that means being more outspoken about human, human rights issues. Uh, I, I think um, uh, China and human rights issues in China were a big concern for the Trump administration. So that won't be uh, a major difference. But, but I think the, the, the idea that Biden so often repeats, which is that at the center of American power is its moral authority will will lead them to, to be very active. I'll just briefly say say a, a couple words about this question of, of unity and division in America. What, what happened uh, on January 6th, the storming of the US Capitol uh, was an extraordinary and, and truly dangerous event. And it was dangerous because Although that mob was not made up of average Trump supporters, there are some tens of millions of Americans who share Trump's view that the election was fraudulent. In other words, who don't believe that our democratic system is working, who are that alienated from it. Biden understands that somehow he's got to find a way to speak to those people and begin to bring them back into a, a, a broad America where they may not agree with his policies, they won't stop being conservative Republicans, but they're not going to be seditious. And I think that's in some ways his most important challenge. It's, it's, it's so amorphous, it's hard to get your arms around it. But I think your viewers should, should pay attention next week as the impeachment uh, trial in the Senate st starts to the question of whether that's going to reignite these very dangerous passions. Biden's doing everything he can not to be drawn into it. And I, I, I think he, he's going to make that a priority. I mean, that could just blow out everything else he wants to do if, if he's not careful. But uh, I'm paying uh, real attention to this question. I Final thought, there's an Australian counterinsurgency uh, strategist named David Kilcullen, who wrote a book called The Accidental Gorilla about... about We've had a couple of problems there, as, as you will have heard with David Ignatius's feed, which is why you've had uh, a lot of vision of me while David's speaking. I will try to get David back, but in the, in the interim, uh, I'm, I'm gonna put one question to Amy. It may well be the last question, and it, but it goes to the same issue that um, David was speaking about there, Amy. This is another audience question from Terence Hull. Terence asks, is it possible to prosecute citizen Trump in federal courts for crimes he committed while president? And I guess the reason that's so relevant is that uh, even though President Biden uh, wants to drag the country forward to the, to the future, President Trump keeps pulling us back. And even if um, he doesn't want to engage with President Trump, there are a lot of lawyers out there who do want to engage with President Trump. So how do you think that criminal legal element might play out and play into this question of uh, President Biden achieving unity? Right. And of course, you know, uh, the question too, and I, and I think that Biden, um, as I recall, um, is not, has said uh, publicly, he's not interested in the Department of Justice necessarily going out and finding ways to prosecute citizen Trump. Um, at the same time, there are legal issues that are already out there, remember, that are much more about his uh, civil issues, about his business that are still sitting uh, in front of the New York Attorney General and, and um, uh, the Manhattan District Attorney. So those cases are still also sitting out there. I think what was really interesting, and I'll, uh, this, is, this has been happening actually as we've been on this call and right before it, um, the House representatives um, decided today for the first time ever that uh, to expel a member from the opposite party from a committee, from her, the committees that she sits on. Um, because of things that she said and uh, tweeted and promoted um, that encouraged things like shooting uh, members of Congress. There's a photo of her standing in front of three members 
of the Democratic Party holding a machine gun. Um, she has pushed conspiracy theories about everything from 9-11 being a hoax to some of the school shootings being uh, false flag operations. And um, Democrats stood up today and said, she should be off of the committees and Republicans, you should join us. And if not, we're gonna go ahead and do it. And so what is happening both with the impeachment vote, now with this vote on this woman, uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, where Democrats seem to be planting their flag and much more so you're right than where Joe Biden is doing it. But Democratic folks on, in Congress is to say, the Democratic Party is going to stand up against this attack, against any uh, white supremacy, terrorism, call it out, not ignore it. And it's up to Republicans to do the same. And if they don't, voters are gonna have a very clear contrast between the two parties. Who stands for what, who believes in what, who's gonna defend what. And I think if you are, it is true as, as David pointed out that you know Joe Biden is ready to move on to his agenda to get beyond Donald Trump. But this isn't just about Donald Trump. I think the worry going forward is what has been stirred by Donald Trump. It's always been there, he didn't invent it. But what has been stirred up and emboldened is still out there. And that the conspiracy theories are still going strong and that these terrorist groups are still out there. And so it is up to Biden to do two things. One, yes, to move on to say we need, to, I, I don't wanna spend my entire presidency um, focused on Donald Trump personally, but what I do need to be focusing on is ridding the country of domestic terrorists and domestic terrorism and saying there is no quarter for them. There will be uh, no way in which uh, this administration is going to let uh, that go. And so I think that you'll see much more on that piece of it than on the let's go after Donald Trump himself piece. All right. I'm delighted to see David Ignatius's face uh, back on the screen. We had a little internet problem uh, earlier. That's how life in the Zoom era goes. We roll with it. David, I want to give you the opportunity, the last word, if you like, um, as you were interrupted earlier. We're just talk Amy was just closing about this question of unifying America, but at the same time, uh, calling out criminal behaviour. So final word to you, David. Well, as I say, I, I, I don't mean to sound uh, uh, overly optimistic. We remain a, a, a frighteningly divided country, but Biden's off to a good start. Uh, I, I think there are parts of the Republican establishment that really want to be free of the Trump era. Uh, Mitch McConnell's finally found a voice to be a, a leader for Republicans. And so, um, you know, my, my theme this week is, is American resilience. We may be back in the swamp uh, before you know it, but, uh, but this week I'd, I'd be a little bit more optimistic. Well, thank you both. Um, I, I think of you both as our code breakers today because on the, on the politics and the policy, you've, you've helped um, break the codes uh, for Australian viewers. Thank you very much. I think the image that I'm taking away is the speedy grandpa, as David uh, put it, of Joe Biden on the highway in the roadster. And I, I guess we all wish him Godspeed. So thank you very much, Amy and David, for joining us. Despite uh, internet snafus, thank you. Thank you everybody else in the audience for joining us for this first Lowy Institute live event for 2021. Um, the Institute Works continues uh, this year. Let me give a little plug to my own podcast, The Director's Chair, where the, the 2021 season begins um, next week. Uh, and the first guest for 2021 will be uh, an old uh, friend of, of David's and mine, David Petraeus. So please join in for that. So again, thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us. Thank you, Amy Walter and David Ignatius. Stay safe and stay well.